Ignition sequence starts. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor and my wife asked me what I wanted for Christmas the other day. You may not, you don't know this, I don't think I've ever brought this up before. For some reason my wife will not let, she does not like footstool, she doesn't want me to have a footstool. Like when you're watching TV, like you sit in your chair and you have a footstool, I don't know what the thing is. But she asked me what I wanted for Christmas, I said I want a footstool. I'd like to be able to put my feet up while I watch TV. And she's like, no, no, you're not getting a footstool. And I said, so the real question, you weren't asking me what I wanted for Christmas. You are asking me, the, the real question is, what do you want for Christmas that I want you to have for Christmas? This is how life, it's probably not just how life works for me. It's probably how life works for many of you out there. <laughs> but that, that's what I'm dealing with here. Caitlin Long, if this is true, then this guy predicted today there's going to be an epic marketing war by all spot Bitcoin ETF issuers, and it's going to be fun watching normies say, wait, wasn't Bitcoin dead all ahead of April having an U.S. presidential election? Now look, folks, update, SEC meetings with spot Bitcoin ETF issuers have been voluminous. SEC source 99% approval and all at once dotted I's and cross T's across all applications, Grayscale doing all it can to be first conversion based on court decision. And then from, from we had this today, SEC spot Bitcoin ETF potential approval window is between January 5th and January 10th, 2024. But then Chad Steingrabber comes out of nowhere with this. I'm telling you, they are coming. Charles Schwab XRP Liquid Index Fund. And it looks like this is from the Charles Schwab website. Ripple XRP Li Liquid Index Fund. Not sure exactly what that is, but nice find. Interesting. Stuart Alderati apparently thinks that there's going to be a, uh, a movie made around, I guess, Ripple XRP the SEC, crypto, ETH gate. He says, when they roll the credits to the movie, I hope they show this picture. This is the general counsel. This is a good sign, by the way. General counsel or chief legal officer for Grayscale. And then on the, to the right of Stuart Alderati, that's the chief counsel for Coinbase. You have to wonder if Stuart Alderati is having a conversation with the grayscale guy about, hey, you remember that XRP trust you had? How about them apples? Then Bill Morgan makes an interesting comment. I think he's an attorney. If, SC, if the SEC versus Ripple case was to settle in the next few days, it would involve Ripple agreeing to pay a fine of 140 to $160 million. I think that number could do it. I believe at this point, I wouldn't be surprised if Ripple gave them a thumbs down and said, nope, we're not giving you that much money, but who knows? I don't know. Maybe they would. Check this out. Ripple partner. This is Ripple partner, uh, Novati. Listen to this guy. We are then making it a multi-chain solution uh, and we'll then shortly thereafter launch on the Ripple network. And then we are negotiating with a couple of other networks, uh, Ethereum network, um, we will uh, also go on to. There is a bit of an issue at the moment in what they call gas fees on the Ethereum network. Um, it does bring the advantage of smart contracts, which are sort of nearly uh, innately part of the Ethereum network. Stellar and Ripple are adding smart contracts to their network, so, so we'll uh, get to them on their networks. But, but in the end, by making it multi-chain, you're actually just meeting, <coughs> excuse me, meeting future uh, demands or needs of of the global payments community. Yeah. 
week. All right. And then here's another interesting clip. This is from the um, Ubri thing that I think Stuart Alderati was asking. For asking example, the other systems like Swift is very uh, complicated and expensive. I'm not going to explain that diagram. Just want to com uh, the complexity of the uh, of the process. So, first point is that uh, we uh, blockchains like uh, like Ripple and XRP are making a good job transforming and disrupting this sector. And my thesis here is that the backbone, the central uh, channel of the remittances, is already transformed. We know the benefits. We are achieving the speed and cost efficiency. We are also achieving currency uh, and security. And you can see that the, the biggest institutional players are already participating here, are already making some projects, creating big volumes here. Oh, yeah? However, the challenge remains what I call in the last mile process of the remittance is when the user has to receive the monies that are sending from the families abroad. Why is that? Because in this, we have some challenges that need to be addressed. For example, accessibility and financial inclusion. Why is this important? And why this is related with DeFi? Stable coins are going to be the entrance for the DeFi ecosystem. DeFi is going to open financial and economic opportunities for these people. All right. Now, um, and then we had this ripple. Th I don't know where this came from, adoption of bank somewhere, but somebody said this. Listen to this. You know, this guy sells it to that guy. That's essentially, you know, what the stock exchange does. So um, if you can have a common ledger um, to, to be able to exchange those IOUs at, then that certainly makes sense. And uh, and there's, uh, there's examples of uh, Korean banks partnering with local uh, you know, Bitcoin companies for the settlement. Uh, you know, people like the IMF or or World Bank or all these kind of people are always talking about these sort of uh, blockchain settlement systems. Nasdaq uh, is involved in in uh, I think doing some trials to Ripple as well. So uh, Nasdaq Ripple trials. Now, little reminder, folks, because a lot of people don't know this. Um, in 1907, okay. Let me see if I can zoom in on this right here. JP Morgan. In 1907, JP Morgan and other Wall Street bankers rescued the banks. There was a stock market collapse, panic. And the New York City from, and they saved New York City from financial ruin. In 1913, Congress passed the Federal Reserve Act, which put the government in charge of managing future financial crises. All right? So in other words, and I think what they learned from this is that from a panic, this is, and this is the model, you saw it in the financial crisis too. From a panic, they can get things done. As I said, I was saying this three, five years ago even. Rahm Emanuel's famous quote, never let a good crisis go to waste because then you can do things that you wanted to do before. Well, I think that evolved by our current government into Never let a crisis that you created go to waste because <laughs> because you can then do what you wanted to do and you created the crisis for the purpose of. That's where I think we are in this country and in this world. That's what I think digital assets and all this regulatory stuff going on is all about. I've played you this video right here of Jim Rickards a million times and I'll play the first part of it again. I was having dinner with a friend not long ago in New York City. We met at a place called Oriol, which is in Midtown. My dinner companion that night was a senior advisor to BlackRock. As you may know, BlackRock is now the largest asset manager on the planet. It directly manages $5 trillion in assets, and it oversees another $11 trillion through its Aladdin platform. That means one firm controls more money than the GDPs of China, Russia, and Japan combined. Anyway, my dinner companion happens to work directly for BlackRock's CEO. As we nursed our white wine and the evening wore on, she let something slip. If I remember her words, she said something like, they want to tell us we can't sell. What was she talking about? Who was she talking about? I placed a few calls, first to my contacts in Washington, then to a few people on Wall Street. Soon I was on a plane for a series of meetings to London, to Geneva, back to New York, then down to South America. As I began connecting the dots, a pattern emerged. 
It revealed a network of more than 189 individuals positioned inside the world's major financial institutions. Some of them hold senior positions inside the IMF, World Bank, and every central bank in the G20, including our own Federal Reserve. These elites share one vision, and they're about to make it a reality. That vision is one world order, one world taxation, and one world money. They've worked for years. But All right. So in the member group, I'm going to go further with this, and I'm going to show you a video of how they're going to do it, um, how I believe they're going to do it. And, and we've, we've shown all kinds of things around this, but now, now that, that I've been kicked off of, of X, I, I, I try to be careful about what I show and where I show it. So at DAIXRP.com is where I show it. So what we're going to talk about is how I think they'll do it, we're also going to, I want to show you a scary warning that, that a, one of the guys running for president was given yesterday. It's really creepy. I'm going to show you that. I'm also, I believe that we are in a, in a, an awakening of sorts. And I believe that we're finding out that a lot of what we've been told from our history are not, there's things that are not true. I'm going to show you one of them in the member group. I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe, hit the like button, tell your friends and family, DAIXRP.com. I think I'm going to show you how they're going to do it.